Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor back. Very, very excited to share today's guest with you because she has a special place in my heart, not only because the work she does is profound and chill inducing, and we'll get into why in a moment, but she is also the first person ever, I, to my knowledge, to reference the Smarter Science of Slim in her very own book. So she sent me a copy and I said, hey, look, she cited my book in her book. So if for no other reason, I'm thankful for that, but but we should all be much more thankful of, of our guest today, which is Brenda Wallenberg. She has a long, many decade history in social work. So helping people deal with obviously very tough situations. And then she turned her passions to nutrition and she is a holistic nutritionist and has developed, she's taken those two diverse skill sets of social work and holistic nutrition and written a book called Overweight Kids in a Toothpick World. She has a website called kidsinbalance.net and she has taken on the Herculean task of helping families deal with the childhood obesity a disease epidemic and wow talk about impactful social work brenda thank you and welcome to the show thank you so much jonathan good to be here brenda what inspired you first to go into social work and then to redirect or augment your efforts with nutrition uh, a, a lot of people end up in social work because they come from slightly dysfunctional families. So I would say a part of it is that, okay? But the other part of it is simply just um, really believing that there can be um, certain practices put into place that can really change your life. So that started off with a whole, you know, emotional, psychological uh, way that we view things, the way that we can grow and develop. Uh, I particularly enjoyed working with children. Uh, when I was in social work, worked a lot with uh, fairly disturbed adolescents and really enjoyed helping them grow and, and move. Um, but I also then became a very sick, very unhealthy social worker uh, just due to the stress of the job, uh, the long hours, uh, the sh massive, now that I'm aware of it, shots of cortisol going through your system on numerous times in the day. So I began to do some research um, for myself and get healthy. And as that changed, thought, man, I really need to blend these two. You, know, you can't just do one or the other. We got to be mind and body healthy. So that's the impetus for kids in balance and in balance. And now, Brenda, how much of your time and mind share is spent I mean, obviously, you, you have a holistic approach, but is your practice now primarily focused on nutrition or do you is it is it really the whole person still? It, it really is the whole person. Like technically, you know, I no longer practice social work, but there would not be a day that goes by in my practice that I'm not using principles I was trained in to work with people looking at, say, the connection with food and emotion, uh, some of the foundational reasons why they have difficulty reaching the goals they say are important to them. So it's absolutely holistically intertwined. I've given up trying to separate which is which and just go with it. <laughs> and what the thing that struck me about your book, Overweight Kids in a Toothpick World, and this struck me way before I actually saw the reference to my own work, so I liked it before <laughs> I saw that. Oh, thank you. Was, and actually, folks, this is a true story, is I read Brenda's book uh, on an airplane trip back home, and I had a young member of my family who was struggling with overweight, and I handed her mother a copy of Brenda's book. So I, I'm not sure you could give a higher endorsement than that. So I That's do pretty impressive. <laughs> salute overweight kids in a toothpick world. But now, Brenda, I want to give the re readers a bit of a gift, help them to understand your approach, the, the approach you present in this book and why it is different because it is. There's so health books are very derivative. Often I found your health book not to be derivative. Thank you. Um, I think the, the primary reason that book works is that it is an outworking of practical application. Um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of research and education to my detriment sometimes. And so there's certainly an educational component in the book and in the Kids and Balance programs that we run. I believe that you have to tap into that right brain sympathetic side and, you know, actually help people realize that they're um, are some foundational underpinnings for the reasons I would be suggesting they do something different. I think if you don't have a really good reason or like a strong why for the choices that you're moving towards, then when things get shaky and something else comes up and you know you weren't planning for that situation to occur, you kind of lose it. So definitely there's an educational component. But the other aspects of 
that are woven through the book and through our program are um, much more to do with the emotional or kind of right brain side, sorry, left brain side of us. So I really um, infuse that, I think, with hope because I really believe that people can change, that there is um, lots of history of that in the people that I've worked with and just in in history in general, that people can learn different ways of doing things. Um, Secondly, again, tapping into that kind of, you know, right side of our brain is, um, and this is, you're going to get the hippie social worker trained in the (laughs) 1980s here. Okay, I keep coming, trying to think of a better word for this, but I haven't yet, which is simply empowerment. Um, You know, if I I say to people, like, what kind of legacy do you want to leave for your kids? You know, what are you currently doing well in your family? Like, how can we, you know, no one is really starting at zero. Most of us have made some movements towards increased health and wellness and towards, you know, a healthier weight range. So, you know, what do you want to pass down to your kids? How can I help you move with that? So really empowering people. I think many parents today, um, they're just confused. Like they go and stand in chapsters or they go onto Amazon. They go, oh my goodness, like there's 18 million books here that I could use that would help me, you know, learn how to, you know, better raise my children. And we forget that intuitively, we actually have a lot of, of, of information that just resonates and we just kind of go, okay, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Let me think, you know, we didn't used to eat this way. You know, uh, I love, I often cite your, you know, history of eating thing and like man alive for only three seconds, you've been eating something like this and only like one second for anything like this. People can resonate with that and go back to what their grandparents ate or their, you know, great grandparents ate. So a lot of that hope and then empowerment and then the last part of that right brain side would be courage. Um, I I say to people, if what you're doing is not getting you where you want to go, it's time to make a switch and do a lot of, um, again, educational, but connection with, understand that big industry, um, food industry, uh, these these people do not care about you. I'm sorry, you know they and and, and that's reality. Like they have, um, you know, if they're publicly traded, their their goal is to produce income. They have to. They're mandated to do that. But they really don't care about the health of your 10 year old or your 13 year old, which is why they can say to you, you know, a pop a day is a good option or whatever. So you know, be courageous because you are going to be swimming upstream. And I guess my goal is to have way more families swimming upstream, so that becomes the norm. And what struck me also about your work, Brenda, is your recommendations are also just not these cookie. I mean, the the standard, right? The standard recommendation is that kids just need to move more, and that is not necessarily wrong. Like that's true, but you you go like what what are the things you see in the standard generic prescription for childhood obesity that makes you shake your head and say either that's incomplete or that's wrong. This is a three-hour interview, right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I, I think the main things are there's just not a recognition of the, the headspace that kids are in and the reality that the whole calories in, calories out you know, formula that you so lovely um, in a lovely manner discount over and over again in your book is that that doesn't work. And so when families are trying to, you know, I won't name the different programs, but virtually, uh, as far as I know, mine's the only program that doesn't go with a um, moderate, you know, calorie reduction, low fat, um, bump up the exercise, get your child out every day for an hour and a half, whatever. Like, it's just, it doesn't make sense. That's not how we used to live. It's not practical in today's world. And so, you know, people try that for a while. They have kids that are complaining about them. They have, uh, or sort of complaining about it. They really um, don't enjoy the food that they're eating. They, the idea of getting a, a child that's 10 years old to the gym, you know, for an hour to an hour and a half a day, is this is not simply a, a reality. So those programs may work for a time with a lot of um, um, almost like whip cracking, of, if it were, of the parent. But they're not, um, again, some of your terms, not sustainable and they are not based on real life. So I'd much rather people learned how to, you know, eat real food as close as possible to its original form. I don't want them to become food fanatics. Uh, they, they need to have room for celebration. Um, the food pyramid or yeah, food health pyramid that I've designed, uh, you may have seen it in the book. The very top category is actually some celebration foods, you know, and families need to figure out ways to incorporate that in ways that are, are healthy and um, uh, life-giving long-term, okay? And Brenda, you not only have 
say clinical practice with this, but you have personal experience with this, right? Right, exactly. Multitudes of experience with this. We have uh, we have five children, and they range in age from seventeen to twenty nine. And you know, kind of going back to what you asked me about, what would be different about some of these other programs? We have children that are very different body or metabolic types. So again, one of the challenges that I find with many of the um, programs that are out there for children who are carrying extra weight or unwell and have lack of energy or whatever, is that they're a one-size-fits-all program. And I speak in copious amounts of experience that not one single one of my children is genetically identical to the other four that we have, you know. So learning the hard way, um, trying to uh, be a vegetarian family for a number of years when it was very clear that my husband, you know, Germanic background, lived on meat 18 times a day, was probably not a good candidate for a raw vegan lifestyle. Okay, those were huge learning curves for me, you know, 20, 25 years ago. And then seeing those um, differences genetically in our children, being able to feed the ones that need to have a much higher, you know, percentage of, say, healthy fats and proteins, the couple that are a little more like me that can tolerate a, a few more of the complex, starchier foods, but just really helping our children, and then in turn, my clients figure out the fuel mix that their body is best designed to function on. That's not common. You don't see that in in books. It's do this, get your child eating this, so many servings of this a day, and if they're hungry, you know, tough luck, uh, if, you know, whatever. It's just like we're not we're not helping kids to be in tune with their body. We're not helping them to figure out what gives them energy, what balances their moods. We're not empowering them to take a better you know hold of their own health. Hey, uh, Brenda, I, I, I'm not a parent myself, but I can um, imagine, and sometimes I actually I feel uncomfortable talking about this because I'm not a parent. Uh, so can you help help me help others and help our listeners? <laughs> How do we balance? Because from the outside looking at as a non-parent, j- just this weekend, I went went to the waterfront in Kirkland, Washington, where I live, and the, just the number of, of children who were significantly overweight is just, just heartbreaking. And, and I don't like, how do you balance? It's, it's, you don't want to guilt trip people, but it is like, I mean, if, if you have a child who's overweight, it's, it's just such a travesty in terms of their metabolic health and their emotional health and their social health. But, but you can't, you know, you can't just guilt trip everyone. So how do, how do we avoid just making everyone feel terrible about themselves and focus instead on solving the problem? I think the the first thing is to really um, understand that there's probably very few parents worldwide who don't want the best for their kids, who don't want them to be healthy and have lots of energy and and not be carrying, you know, extra weight, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I I, I don't think I've ever found a parent who didn't care about that. But the problem is, is that there's a lot of confusion. And so I would say the first thing to do is to really come alongside parents who have kids that are, you know, Um, overweight or obese and help them understand that you understand how they feel, that they're probably confused. They, uh, there's probably a lot of guilt tripping already going on. They don't need us to, to add to that. And for many of them, uh, when I work with a, a child, I work with a family. So for many of them, there are patterns of Uh, dysfunctional eating or lack of understanding of eating in parents as well. So they are modeling things that for them sometimes are hard to give up because they have their own emotional connections to food or their own things that they're unraveling around why they do certain, why they go to certain things for comfort or whatever. So for sure, um, having them understand that we, we get their pain and that we aren't judging them and that we actually want to help them unravel that themselves so they can then um, be a more helpful model and set better practices in place in their family. Brenda, I think you hit the nail on the head there because yes, who, what parent is going to knowingly poison them? I mean, parents don't give their children cigarettes. So that's why I've, I've always struggled yes. with it. it. It is a knowledge problem because if you know something is bad for your child, truly bad for your child, I have yet to ever meet a parent who hands their child a cigarette. Even though it might be lovely and it's a celebration, you still don't give the child cigarettes because you know it's bad. But I've met many, many parents who every edible product they give their child, they give to their child because they do believe it's healthy because the package says it is, or it's fortified, or it gives you energy to play, or it's got healthy whole grains in it. So so how yeah. how do we combat that 
they, they are they are doing the best with the information they've been given. It's just the information they've been given is either from corrupt sources or it's just uh, bad information. Correct. Exactly. And that's where we go back to you know the education part. And we actually work with parents to help them understand that, but then we give them tools so that they can actually put that into place with their children. So, for example, if I'm teaching in an elementary setting, uh, I bring in um, activity centers. And so we'll have an activity center that is uh, a label reading activity. But unlike, t- you know, typical, you know, looking for the healthy heart signal or whatever recommended by the American Diet Association or whatever, we look at ingredients and we're not looking at calorie count. We're looking at, is it real food? We're looking at are the ingredients and that we don't recognize. Are we looking at, uh, you be very happy to hear this protein to carbohydrate ratio. You know, <laughs> um, we're looking at where's the fat coming from. So we're actually teaching people uh, to how to teach their children to be little, um, you know, uh, sheriffs in the in the grocery <laughs> market. Okay, uh, and and again, even within that, we'll often do a, um, a kind of like a traffic light thing where we'll have a red placemat and a green placemat and a yellow placemat and have them put it down based on who they are. So for someone that is a, an extreme protein type, you know, even a really healthy quinoa, you know, kind of a, you know, dish would not necessarily be uh, something they could have very often. And so they start to learn also that in their family, maybe someone might be able to eat something a little more often than they do. So we'll do activities like that, that again, are things that parents can do in the home with their younger children. Um, if they have teens, again, when, when I'm working, um, I, I, I'll resort having worked pred- a lot with teens in social work and then having obviously my own. Um, I will resort to absolutely tapping into what is primarily important to them. And a lot of tongue-in-cheek stuff when I'm teaching in, in high schools around, okay, the name I talk today is how to clear up your skin, you know, look good to the people you want to look good to, and maybe get an A in your personal planning class, okay? So you, <laughs> have, to, you have to tap into what is important to teenagers, and they are not thinking, oh my goodness, or, seriously, are you telling me if I eat really well right now, that when I'm 50, you know, I can run a half marathon, I'm going to look super amazing, and, you know, I'm not going to have joint pains. They're not, they're thinking like, you know, Friday, maybe, if this is <laughs> Thursday. So we have to recognize that and give them things that are short-term, you know, recognize that, that they don't have the same ability to delay gratification, um, uh, they they need more of a you know believe it or not they need their parents to actually parent and you know not have certain things in the house and you know um, be able to actually set some boundaries. Um, I'll tell you a quick little story. I had a client come in and and them with their with their family and she was just saying that you know one of her children was you know, eating a lot more potato chips lately than normal. And they were kind of concerned about that. And I knew them well enough to be able to tongue in cheek, say to this little eight-year-old, oh, you know, so do you have a, do you have a job since I saw you last? And he goes, no, I don't have a job. I go, oh, so you're now in charge of buying the groceries in your house? He goes, I don't buy the groceries in my house. And the mom was able to sit there and go, bingo. Yes, I, the reason we're having so many potato chips now is because I'm buying them and bringing them in. So being able to help parents see that they do need to parent. They don't have to be their kid's best friend. They need to get them through the healthy eating and lifestyle of the things, the same way they get them through doing their chores, doing their homework, those kind of things as well. I love it. I love it. Well, Brenda, what, what's next for you and, and the Kids in Balance effort? Well, um, currently we, we mainly uh, do on-location programs and some online programs, but this fall is a really big, big push to go digital. We have lots of people in uh, different parts of the country. We've got some interest um, in, in Mexico, a Spanish-speaking population, there's a lot of childhood obesity happening. In, in Mexico, their rates are kind of coming up to ours. So we're looking at moving our program, similar to the way you do you know, podcasts and being able to have people uh, get information more easily accessible online from their home, but still support them, still offer uh, a nutritionist to work with them online at the same time. So that's kind of where our next step is going. I love it. I love it. Well, folks, wow, Brenda is putting together her plan to to heal the world, which is a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful plan. In the meantime, she's taken great strides and you can enjoy them yourself by picking up a copy of her book, which is Overweight Kids in a Toothpick World, which again, I can say, personally, I have read and given to someone in my family who is struggling with these issues. Can't give a higher endorsement than that, so I would recommend picking up a copy. You'd also check out her website at kidsinbalance.net. Brenda, thank you so much for all that you do. It's been an absolute pleasure. You're welcome. Really enjoyed it. 
Everyone, her name is Brenda Wallenberg, and I hope you enjoyed today's conversation as much as I did. And please remember, this week and every week after, eat smarter, exercise smarter, and live better. Chat with you soon.